I'm uh, Dr. Beverly Whipple. I'm a professor emerita at Rutgers University, and uh, I've been retired for quite a while, but I'm still conducting research. So um, I'm very honored to have been invited to talk with you today about at this National Sex Ed Conference. And I always give research presentations, so, but today I'm going to talk about how sexuality educators can find and use research and then talk about how I became involved in the field of sexual health and in my research program. I hope that this will encourage you to find and apply research findings and may also, if you're interested, to conduct your own research if you choose to do that. Uh, I also hope that there'll be time at the end for us to discuss how you can use my research findings in your work as a sexuality educator. The best way for you to find out about uh, the latest research in major areas is to attend the annual conference of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality, or what's called Quad S. It's held in the beginning of November in various venues around the United States. And you can choose to attend the talks about the research that would best meet your needs. There are other organizations where research is presented, such as uh, I've, my family has sponsored the Whipple Family Plenary at the annual ASEC meeting in which it's uh, based on research and meetings of STAR, Society for Sex Therapy and Research, and the International Academy of Sex Research. The two latter uh, groups are more advanced, but I really think that you have to go to the, these meetings to find out about the latest research. Okay, uh, the Journal of Sex Research is uh, the Quad S publication, and you can get a lot of information from this journal. And um, I think it's just important for you to be aware of it. Again, there are, um, there are many, many, um, there's all research is presented at this meeting, and uh, I won the Bigel Award from them uh, for the best uh, article published in the Journal of Sex Research back in 1988, and um, also received an award from them for the best book written in 2006, my Science of Orgasm book. So um, other journals that publish research that you might want be interested in are the Journal of Sexual Medicine, the Journal of Sexuality and Relationship Therapy, and sexuality and disability. And these are more specific to us uh, areas within sexual health. You can also do an online search, and I'm sure you all know how to do searches, for research in the areas that you are interested in. What I'd like to do now is to tell you a little about, bit about how I got into the area of sexuality education and sexuality research and then we can talk about how you can use mine or others' research in, as a sexuality educator. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, fine. Don't laugh. <laughs> we have to go back to the early 1970s when I was teaching nursing in Camden, New Jersey. One of my students asked me, what can a man do sexually after he has a heart attack? And I thought it was an excellent question, but all I didn't know the answer. All I knew is that, uh, if he climbed two flights of steps and got short of breath, there could be a problem. So I spoke to the other nursing faculty, and we decided to have a consultant from Marriage Council of Philadelphia come in. And this is where Harold Leaf, Bill Staten, and many other people uh, worked. And we had them come and help us to incorporate sexuality into the nursing curriculum. And we worked hard to do this, and then we had to present the new curriculum to the Board of Trustees of the nursing program while I was uh, for their approval. And they said that we could not implement the curriculum because we would be talking about, now listen to the word I'm going to say, we'd be talking about masturbation and all those awful things. So I uh, quit my job, and I moved to another college, this nursing program, and I took three graduate courses in sexuality, one each su uh, summer that were offered by ASECT. You know, do you all know ASECT? Okay. Um, 
And I started to attend uh, professional sexuality organizational meetings. And at an East meeting, you now East uh, was in Philadelphia, and this was what Star became. So it was East before Star, so you know I'm way back. I met Bob Francoeur and many other well-known sexuality health professionals. Alan Warbach, Sandra Lieblum, Alex Comfort, Wardell Pomeroy. And Bob Francourt invited me to uh, be a facilitator at a, SAW, at a SAW, sexual attitude reassessment, that he was giving at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I became more convinced of the need for sexuality education in the nursing curriculum. So I started uh, incorporating sexuality into the nursing curriculum where I was now teaching, and also started a course at our college that was the most popular course on campus that was open to anyone. So that's how I got into being a sexuality educator. In 1980, I wrote an article about incorporating sexuality education for health professionals at the invitation of Bill Staten, some of you may know, who taught one of the ASEC graduate courses I took. So that's how I started as a sexual health educator, and I still give talks about sexual health to the general public worldwide. I've been very blessed. I've spoken in 95 countries, and um, I'm still interested in giving sexual health information uh, to the general public as, as well as professionals. I'm going to summarize uh, over 35 years of research from the G-spot to PET scans and functional MRIs of the brain during orgasm. But before I can discuss these research findings, I think it's important for me to put these findings in the context of how I view sexuality and sexual expression, because I think this, this is a foundation for me. Okay. Uh, in the past, as you know, sexuality was viewed as having one purpose, and that was reproduction. But now we see it as an important aspect of our health. And when the term sexuality is viewed holistically, it refers to the totality of a being. It refers to all the qualities, not just the genitals and their function. And it includes all the qualities, biological, psychological, emotional, cultural, social, and spiritual, that make people who they are. And we all have the capacity to express our sexuality in any of these areas. It doesn't just have to be through the genitals. I carry a candy cane with me to explain what I mean. When you eat a candy cane, the red is the peppermint flavor. Where do you taste the peppermint? Just when you get to the red or throughout the candy cane? Throughout the candy cane. That's how our sexuality is. It goes throughout all of us. And that's the concept I want you to be, uh, understand. Um, I wrote about this and uh, published it in the 1980 article that I showed you before. And this brings me to another concept that I want to share with you about sexuality. I personally am pleasure oriented, uh, not goal oriented. And I don't want to have people set up my research findings as a goal that they have to, they or their partner have to achieve. I never use the word reach or achieve orgasm. I talk about experiencing it. My objective in conducting research has been to validate the, exper the sexual experiences of women, not to create new goals. If someone says this is pleasurable to me, I try to validate it in the laboratory. Now there are two ways of looking at sexual experience. The most common is goal-directed, which is analogous to climbing a flight of stairs. You start with touch, kiss, caress, penis-vagina contact to the top step of the big O or orgasm. And people who are goal-directed, if they don't reach that top step, they don't feel very good about the whole process that has occurred. Uh, the alternative view is pleasure-directed, and which here I can, you look at this as a circle, with each expression on the perimeter of the circle and end in itself. And those question marks are for you to add something that you like. So, um, and I think it's really important because some people like to be held, some people like to kiss. Whatever it is, it's important and it's satisfying to the com uh, couple. Now, you, as I said, you can add your own form on the question marks, and there's no need to have this form of expression lead to anything else. Now, think what would happen if one person in a couple is goal-directed, and who is this typically? Men. And what, the other person <laughs> is pleasure-directed, and who is that typically? Uh, so, uh, and just think, it could be vice versa, of course. 
uh, or same-sex uh, couples. But problems may occur if they don't realize their goals or they don't communicate what their goals are to their partners. So I think that's important. I published this in 1989. I did not plan to become a researcher, but at an ASEC meeting around 1977, I met John Perry, who had developed an electronic perianometer to measure pelvic muscle strength, which could be used as a biofeedback device. Let me show you that. I thought this device would be very helpful, would be excellent to help to use to teach women how to uh, do Kegel exercises for stress urinary incontinence. That's when a woman loses some urine if she jumps, coughs, sneezes. And so I began teaching Kegel exercises to treat stress, ur urinary stress incontinence without having surgery. But some of the women who came to me to treat their stress incontinence had very uh, strong pelvic muscles. Where with stress incontinence, your pelvic floor muscles are very weak. And these women with strong pelvic muscles stated that the, they, experience the, they had the experience of fluid coming from the urethra, the tube you urinate through, that was triggered by stimulation of a sensitive area felt through their vaginal wall. And I talked to John Perry about this, and we, led, we did a search of the literature, which you, you're all gonna do, and found an article written by Dr. Ernst Grafenberg in 1950 called The Role of the Urethra in Female Orgasm. And he described a sensitive area that's felt through the anterior or the top wall of the vagina and an expulsion of fluid from the urethra that was different from urine when this area is stimulated. This led to our study of 400 women looking for vaginal sensitivity and our rediscovery of and naming of this area called the Grafenberg spot or the G-spot. And this is the area of the G-spot. This is a woman standing up and this is the bladder, the urethra, the vagina, and the uterus. Okay, and this is the area you have to feel through the front wall or the anterior wall of the vagina with like a come here motion. Uh, it's halfway between the back of the pubic bone and the cervix along the course of the urethra, and it swells when it's stimulated, although it's not possible to palpate in an unstimulated state. This is why it's not found in gynecological examinations, because physicians or nurse practitioners don't sexually stimulate patients, and it's also blocked by the bivalve speculum. Um, this shows uh, a model with someone stimulating the area of the, uh, the G-spot. Uh, the Grafenberg spot is not, has not been found universally by all researchers who have conducted sexological examinations of the vagina. It may be the lack of universality, maybe due to different methods of stimulating the different areas or different criteria for looking at this. I want to go to just a little personal aside, and that is I had the honor a few years ago of meeting Dr. Grafenberg's medical assistant in New York City. She was 93 at the time and uh, we met and my husband filmed us and this video is in the Kinsey Institute with all my archives. Uh, but when she died last year, her daughter gave me two of the original Grafenberg rings. These were the first IUDs that he developed and they found them in women in autopsies, never had any problem with any infection or anything else. So that's just a little personal aside. Now let's go back to the research. Uh, as I said, I found that some of our, our subjects were women who, could only, who only lost fluid at orgasm or during sexual stimulation. And these women seem to have very strong pelvic muscles. The pubic coccygeus muscle goes from the pubic bone in the front to the coccyx in the rear in animals that wags the tail when they relax and contract the muscle. So we designed a study to determine if there was a significant difference in the muscle strength of women who claimed to ejaculate and those who did not. And what we found is the women we call ejaculators, their vaginal muscles were twice as strong as the non-ejaculators and the uterine muscles were three times as strong. So it was, there was a significant difference between the muscle strength of these women. Female ejaculation, this phenomenon refers to an expulsion of fluid from the urethra that is different from urine. Many women reported that they had surgery to correct this problem, and others reported that they uh, stopped having orgasm to prevent wetting the bed. The fluid was described as looking like watered down, fat-free milk, tasting sweet, and usually about three to five cc's or a teaspoon in volume. 
We and others did a number of chemical analysis of the fluid. Um, this slide shows the difference between urine and female ejaculation. The data re uh, reported here show a significant difference between urine and the female ejaculation in terms of prostatic acid phosphatase, prostatic specific antigen, and urea and creatinine. These are byproducts of protein metabolism that are found in urine. We also found a significant elevation in glucose in the ejaculate, and other researchers reported a significant elevation in fructose. Cabello from Spain reported that he tested the hypothesis that all women ejaculate, although because the amount is so small and most women are lying on their backs, it may not be expelled, and some may have what he called retrograde ejaculation into the bladder. And he found significant differences in prostatic acid phosphatase between pre-orgasmic and post-orgasmic urine specimens. PSA is what we test for, for prostatic uh, cancer in men. Xavier Cech from Slovakia has also reported PSA being secreted by the female prostate. A study published in 2011 in the Journal of Sexual Medicine and conducted by, in Guadalajara, Mexico, by Alberto Rubio Castillas and at the, University of, uh, at the University of Guadalajara and by Emmanuel Giannini from Italy. And this demonstrates that female ejaculation and what's called squirting or gushing are two different phenomena. They state that the real female ejaculation is a release of a very scanty, uh, thick, and whitish fluid from the female prostate gland, while the squirting is an expulsion of diluted urine from the urinary bladder. There, have, there are some components of the female ejaculation in the diluted uh, squirting or gushing, but that is not female ejaculation. And they uh, conduct a biochemical analysis on the different fluids and compared them to urine. Uh, Zaviacek in Bratislava, uh, Slovakia, reported that the periurethral or the skein's glands are the female uh, prostate gland, and this is where the female ejaculation is coming from. The uh, name of these glands has officially been changed to the female prostate gland, and we also believe that this is uh, part, this tissue is part of the area that we identified as the Grafenberg or the G-spot. Keep going. Uh, based on these findings, it's evident that some women expel a fluid from the urethra that is different from urine during sexual activities and orgasm, and some women may expel some urine. In some women, G-spot stimulation, orgasm, and female ejaculation are related while in other women they are not related. Some women have reported experiencing ejaculation um, without orgasm, and the phenomenon has been reported by most women who experience it as extremely pleasurable. So I hope women uh, who enjoy this will not have surgery to designed to eliminate it, and they also won't have the injections. I don't know if you've heard of the G-shot, but this really scares me. These are injections for collagen into the area where they think the Grafenberg spot is, but they don't look for it. It has not been tested in double-blind placebo-controlled studies, so no studies have been published on this G-shot, but it's offered all over the United States and franchised all over the world. And women pay about $3,000 every three month to months to have this shot, which we have no data to say that it's effective. So the information that I just presented can be found in the 205 classic edition of the book, uh, The G-Spot, and I saw that they have that out here. So keep going. Okay. Okay. So on to my PhD. Um, we published these studies in 1981 and in the first edition of The G-Spot in 1982. Vern Bulla, a sexuality researcher and a nurse, spoke to me at a quad -S meeting and said I had to get my doctorate in a hard science. In 1981, I wanted to go to the World Congress of Sexology, which is now WASP, but in Israel, but I could not afford to go. So I wrote for copies of papers, uh, abstracts of papers that were of interest to me. And one person I contacted with, communicated with, was Barry Komisarek from Rutgers University. And he had heard about our research from Benjamin Graber. John Perry and I wrote two chapters in Graber's book, Circumvaginal Mus Musculature and Sexual Function. Barry invited me to teach a class at Rutgers about our research. 
and he had conducted a series of studies in laboratory rats that demonstrated that vaginal uh, mechanical stimulation in rats produces a strong pain blocking effect stronger than 10 milligrams of morphine per kilogram of body weight. And, uh, but most the convincing evidence of that, that vaginal cervical stimulation blocks pain, required a verbal report for women. And I wondered, what was the G-spot there? Was it just for pleasure, or did it have an adaptive significance? So this is where I went for my PhD in neurophysiology, the heart science that Vern Bala had recommended. Consequently, we, we performed a series of studies in women measuring pain thresholds during vaginal self-stimulation. And we found that the elevation in pain threshold, pain detection threshold increased by a mean of 47% when they just put pressure on the area of the G-spot. Uh, using a firm mitt did not elevate. Uh, we had them watch the train chase scene from the French Connection. None of that uh, caused the pain thresholds to elevate. When stimulation was self-applied in a pleasurable way, pain thresholds uh, increased uh, by 84%. And uh, when the women reported orgasm, which we didn't ask them to do, but some did, the pain thresholds went up to uh, 107% uh, during orgasm. And there were no increases in tactile or touch thresholds. This demonstrates that the effect was an analgesic effect, not an anesthetic effect, and not a distracting effect. The analgesic effect was produced by pressure and pleasurable self-stimulation uh, applied to the anterior wall of the vagina, through the anterior wall of the vagina, the area we called the G-spot. We then demonstrated that an analgesic effect also occurs naturally during labor. Uh, we believe that childbirth would be much more painful without this natural analgesic effect. Uh, which is activated as the pelvic, the hypogastric, and possibly the sensory vagus nerves are stimulated as the cervix dilates and pressure in the vagina produced by the emerging fetus. Further animal studies reveal that when newborn rats are injected with a chemical called capsaicin, they do not get this natural analgesic effect when they are adults. This led to what I thought was a very interesting study based on my observations made of women during labor. That is, Spanish-speaking women in my area, southern New Jersey, where I was teaching obstetrical nursing at the time, many years ago, seemed to have a harder, ta harder time during labor, which I thought was cultural until I learned of the studies in laboratory rats. I hypothesized that women who have chronically ingested a diet high in hot chili peppers, the main pungent ingredient of which is capsaicin, would have a diminished analgesic effect to vaginal self-stimulation. So we conducted a study at the University of Veracruz in uh, Jalapa, Mexico. And we found women who fell into three different groups depending on their dietary consumption of hot uh, chili peppers. These women were born, raised, and always lived in the same geographic area. And so we controlled for that variable. And the results of this study support my hypothesis. Uh, that is, women who had, had diets high in hot chili peppers, the groups in white, did not get the pain blocking effect as women did who had diets medium or low in hot chili peppers. They were very similar to the women in the United States in terms of their elevation in pain thresholds. So, um, so they did not get the uh, natural pain blocking effect. We published this in Physiology and Behavior in 1989, Whipple et al. And it's interesting, that still tops the list for my most frequently requested publications. Even the Nippon meat packers in Japan requested copies of this study because they put chili in their meat. Uh, we are conducting a study in Mexico comparing the pain thresholds of women during labor and then retrospectively we'll look at those who have had a diet high in hot chili peppers with those who have diets low in hot chili peppers. Anecdotally reports from other countries such as India state that women are told not to eat the hot spicy food about three months before they're due to deliver. And I spoke to a group of physicians, OBGYN physicians, about five, six hundred of them in Kuala Lumpur, excuse me, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And they confirmed this. That is in Malaysia there are three ethnic groups. Indian, Malays, and Chinese. And I said, is there any group that seems to have a harder time during labor? And they all said women from India.
or Indian descent. So there is something to this. Um, now I'm going to go back to my personal history for a minute. By the time I completed my PhD in neurophysiology in 1986, I obtained a second master's degree in nursing because Rutgers College of Nursing wanted me on their faculty and they offered me a very large grant to build a human physiology laboratory, but I needed a master's in nursing to be able to teach there, so I did that. And the next, I completed that the next year and started teaching and conducting research at Rutgers. Another area, uh, type of orgasmic response we measured in my new human physiology laboratory was orgasm from imagery alone. That is, no one, including the woman herself, touched her body, but she experienced orgasm. And we found out that the physiological correlates of orgasm, that is a significant elevation in blood pressure, heart rate, pupil diameter, and pain thresholds, were the same during orgasm from genital self-stimulation and orgasm from imagery alone. And we did that in a counterbalanced way. So I found that very interesting that women could experience orgasm just from thinking, no one touching their body. Uh, I also continued my research program of validating uh, women's experiences to validate the subjective reports of women with complete spinal cord injury, that they do indeed experience orgasm. These women were told, based on the literature, that they could not experience orgasm, or if they did, it was a phantom orgasm quote unquote. And we have documented that women with complete spinal cord injury do indeed experience orgasm from self-simulation of the anterior wall of the vagina, the cervix, and a hypersensitive area of their body above the level of their spinal cord injury. And this just shows, uh, we have women with above T10, and this shows the nerves going into the spinal cord. Uh, However, our subjects with complete spinal cord injury, uh, they had significant increases as observed in women uh, without spinal cord injury, and it was above the level of where their, these nerves go into the spinal cord. So to account for this unexpected and really surprising finding, we, public, we postulated the existence of a sensory pathway that bypasses the spinal cord and goes directly to the brain and uh, carrying sensory input from the vagina and cervix to the brain. We postulated this to be the sensory vagus nerve. And um, this just shows some of the nerve pathways. To test whether the vagus nerve uh, provides vaginal sens uh, sensory pathway in women, we hypothesize that the brain regions to which the vagus nerve projects, the NTS, nucleus tractus solitaris, would be activated by cervical stimulation in women with complete spinal cord injury above the level of entry of the uh, other nerves that uh, supply the genital region. And we found out that with PET scans that we did get activity in the NTS, and then we started doing functional MRI uh, because we get much better resolution. Now, I'm not gonna bore you all with all my brain scans, but, um, because I want to have time for questions and answers. But I will show you the pictures, all right? Without going into all the detail. All right, this is what the unit looks like. The, these, these are the PET scans, and we can see that the NTS is activated, but it's very difficult to tell. This is uh, using PET scans of the brain, and you can see in women with spinal cord injury, and we can see that the NTS is activated uh, during self-stimulation. So this is just showing the whole uh, brain. And these are the regions that are activated before self-stimulation and during stimulation. So you can see what areas of the brain are activated. And imagery-induced orgasm, we got the same areas activated as by vaginal self-stimulation or imagery. So I just wanted you to see that we have been doing this, but I, it's, it's, I think it's too detailed to go into for right now. And, um, okay, all of these uh, studies are reviewed in the book, The Science of Orgasm, and for the general public, and it's by Sarah it came in to be a co-author with us, and uh, that's available here, the, um, the Orgasm Answer Guide. Um, can I just say something, Sarah, about you? Don't say that. <laughs> uh, no? I wanted to be culturally sensitive when we wrote this book, and my colleagues, 
Uh, one was the top researcher in Mexico caused by a Barry Commissaric. And I wanted somebody from a different culture. So Sarah helped us with this. She's a sex and relationship therapist. And we did make the, the book culturally sensitive. And I really appreciate her contributions for that as well. So I want to conclude by saying that orgasm in women is in the brain. It's felt in many body regions. And it can be stimulated by many body regions, as well as from imagery alone. Orgasm is not just a reflex. It's a total body experience, and we need to continue to be open to documenting the various sensual and sexual experiences reported by women. Now, people need to be also be encouraged to feel good about the variety of ways that they experience sensual and sexual pleasure without uh, setting up specific goals, such as finding the G-spot or experiencing female ejaculation. I believe that healthy sexuality begins with the acceptance of the self in addition to the emphasis on the process rather than the goals of sexual interactions. So I'm going to go back to my history now. Uh, I was very fortunate in that the professional organizations not only accepted my proposals to speak at their conferences, but my colleagues gave me so much encouragement and feedback. I felt I had to give back to the organizations for all of their support. And I did this through my volunteer work on their boards. I served as the ASEC board, on the ASEC board for nine years and was president of ASEC from 1998 to 2000. I served on the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality Board, or QUAD-S, from, uh, for eight years and was president from, uh, of QUAD-S from 2002 to 2003. I was the first person to be president of both of these organizations. I've been on the foundation for the scientific study of sexuality for so many years that they made me an emeritus status. And I was on the executive uh, committee of the World Association for Sexual Health for 12 years. I was vice president from 2001 to 2005 and secretary general treasurer from 2005 to 2009. And you'll hear more about WASS later this afternoon. And also, I was a director of ISHWISH, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. So I gave back to the professional organizations in this way because they helped me so much. I've been, in preparing for this talk, I counted awards that I have received, and I found over 115, uh, including being named a fellow in both of my professions, uh, nursing and sexuality. And also, a really great honor to me was I was named one of the 50 most influential scientists in the world by the New Scientist for their 50th anniversary. And I was only one of five women so named, and the only one in the field of sexual health. So I thought that was quite an honor. I did receive the gold medal from the World Association for Sexual Health and the Masters and Johnson Award from the Society for Sex Therapy and Research, or STAR both for my lifetime achievements and contributions. I've also had a research institute named after me in, uh, at the University of Puebla and three other colleges in Puebla and the Mexican government. And I've co-authored seven books, over 200 uh, research publications and book chapters, and I've given over 800 professional talks and have been featured on hundreds of TV and radio shows. So where do I go from here? <laughs> well, I hope to spend more time with our family. Here's my, uh, we are at my husband Jim's birthday party and uh, have to show you the rest of the family. Uh, we renewed our vows for our 50th anniversary, which was three years ago, with our whole family participating and it was really an honor. This, my youngest granddaughter picked out this dress and bought it for me and it fit me perfectly. I never would have picked that out. And so, uh, <laughs> so that was fun. Um, Jim and I have our bucket lists and we're more selective about where and how we spend our time. And um, I thank you. This is my email address if you want to contact me. I also have a whole lot of cards up here. And I want time for questions and answers, but I'd like to end with something. And then can I read one other thing to you? And then we can have questions and answers. Um, I need about three or four minutes to do this, if I may. OK? What I'd like to talk, do now is to read you something that's a little different. It was a poem that was sent to me by email, and it really made an impact on me personally. I didn't know the author, 
But when I started, when I uh, shared this in Amman, Jordan in 2002, someone there found the author. And it's Brian Dyson, who was a former CEO of Coca-Cola. So I hope it will help you as a sexuality health professional to keep your work in perspective. And if so, then perhaps I've offered you something more than just to talk about how you can get into research and my research. So do you mind if I read this to you? And I have some copies if anybody thinks it's important, it was to me. The poem is called Life. Imagine life as a game in which you are juggling some five balls in the air, and you name them work, family, health, friends, and spirit. And you're keeping all of these in the air. You will soon understand that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. But the other four balls, family, health, friends, and spirit, are made of glass. If you drop one of these, they will be irrevocably scuffed, marked, nicked, damaged, or even shattered. They will never be the same. You must understand that and strive for balance in your life. How? Don't undermine your worth by comparing yourself with others. It's because we are different that each of us is special. Don't set your goals by what other people deem important. Only you know what is best for you. And don't take for granted the things that are closest to your heart. Cling to them as you would your life. For without them, life is meaningless. And don't let your life slip through your fingers by living in the past or for the future. It's by living your life one day at a time that you live all the days of your life. And don't give up when you still have something to give. Nothing is really over until the moment you stop trying. And don't be afraid to admit that you are less than perfect. It's this fragile thread that binds us each together. Don't be afraid to encounter risks. It's by taking chances that we learn how to be brave. And don't shut, shut love out of your life by saying it's impossible to find. The quickest way to receive love is to give. The fastest way to lose love is to hold it too tightly. And the best way to keep love is to give it wings. And don't run through life so fast that you, not, you forget not only where you've been, but also where you were going. And don't forget that a person's greatest emotional need is to feel appreciated. Don't be afraid to learn. Knowledge is weightless, you, a treasure you can always carry easily. And don't use words or time carelessly. Neither can be retrieved. Life is not a race, but a journey to be savored each step of the way. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is mystery, and today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Thank you. And I did lead time, which is what I wanted to do, to be able to talk with you about how you can um, incorporate research or how you can use research in your professional life. So what questions do you have or comments do you have? Now can I say something? If you'd like. So when I started, actually, I met Beverly about 15 years ago, that was the luck of my life. Because then she was the person who told me, are you serious about this young woman? And I said, yes. And then go get a PhD. <laughs> and then as I went through get, you know, finishing my college and then master's and then PhD, I was just sending, you know, sending emails to Beverly. I think everybody should have a mentor. Just pick them wisely. I'm not saying maybe this is the wisest thing I've ever done in my whole life but really pick them wisely. And then, you know, because a mentor, not only in profession, but also she's my adopted American mom now. So it's very really <laughs> important, you know, at various levels. So she calls me, she set me straight, and you know, you need to spend time with your son now, okay? To get the head out, out of his meeting room. So you know, this is really important that, you know, have somebody by your side. We all have families, God bless them, but it's very really important to have somebody as mentor. That's all I wanted to share, and thank you forever. And I, I now am the adopted grandmother of Alex, yes. too. <laughs> his American grandparents. Yes. Okay, qu uh, questions. How can I help you to incorporate research into what you do? Yes? Yeah, for those of us that don't come from a scientific background and have access to that, how is it, if we have an idea that we want to have tested in the scientific realm, how can we have that happen? Find somebody who is a researcher in an area that you are interested in. I mean, you can go for your PhD. I've met a number of people here now who are doing their doctorates at Widener 
in an area they're interested in. But if you are interested, you have an idea, find somebody who's uh, at a research institute who is interested in doing the same thing. So it's just, you know, someone like me or somebody who's really interested in sexual health and they will work with you. And then you'll get some publications and get, find out the answers to what you want to. But you need somebody who is a researcher to help design the studies. Does that make sense? Yeah. So where are you geographically? Uh, I'm in San Francisco. Oh, no problem. Lots of people there. Sarah, turn around and meet someone from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and there's people who can help you and that's what I would suggest doing if you have an idea for a research study go go for it we need more research we need so much more research in the field of sexual health we know so little so, just a minute Elise somebody here no okay I thought someone there had a, their hand up Elise so is the uh, field of research in women's sexuality very crowded <laughs> uh, no <laughs> Uh, I don't know who else, but very few of us are doing research in the area of, of women's sexuality. Um, what happened is uh, most of the researchers were men. It's much e I don't have my slide, I have a funny slide. It's much easier to study men. I have this slide of this machine with one dot for men and about 40, 50 dots for women. Uh, it's much easier to study men than it is women, and uh, most of the researchers are men. So there's very little research being conducted on women's sexual health. And we need more information, a lot more. Yes? So if women can have orgasms sleeping, they have them while they're sleeping as well? Women uh, have reported orgasm while sleeping. We have not measured any in the fMRI unit of women sleeping. But we have measured orgasms from them stimulating certain parts of their body, clitoris, G-spot, cervix, nipple, and we've also had them think about stimulating those areas. And we get the same brain activity, whether they're thinking about it or whether they're self-stimulating. And we can tell in the frontal lobe of the brain what area specifically that they were thinking about or stimulating. So it's really, it's really exciting research to be doing. But that's what I like. I mean, <laughs> but whatever you like to do, there's people we can find to help you. Yes. Um, so let's say that research wouldn't necessarily be, so I plan on going for a doctorate, but I don't necessarily want to go research, but I would love to be, have research be part of it. Mm -hmm. Would I need to pair with someone in order to be No, well, No, if you're going for your doctorate, there will be people at the school that you're going to who are, will help you with the research. They'll help you design a study, because you have to do a dissertation. Yeah. And they will help you with that. I'm trying to see some of the people I've been talking to earlier today. There's a number of people who are, uh, their research, they're doing it for their doctorate. And there, there are people on the staff who have doctorates who do research, and it doesn't have to be physiological like I do. There's all kinds of research that can be conducted and that we need conducted. Yes? I just have a question about the conflicting information that I seem to find on the internet with the most recent research around the G-spot. Mm -hmm. So I agree, I mean, I realize the men that are researching Uh, so I get that piece of it, but in terms of the fluid and where it's coming from, mm -hmm. you're the source of Okay, the, of all right, I'll, I'll, I'll answer those, but I also want to say that there's a person out there who publishes all over the place by the name of Vincente Pupo, P-U-P-P-O, <laughs> if some of you have heard of him, and he's never conducted any research study. He just criticizes whatever anybody does. <laughs> and so uh, I just wrote a review article in which I cite his criticisms because they're not based on anything. Um, what does he call the vagina, the female penis? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it has no data to support what he's saying. But yes, there are people who criticize. And you, you yes, another part of that question. The, the pieces of like, so I've always told people that it's clear colorless, uh, or clear odorless fluid, and then the last study from, two, or one of the last studies from 2011 was more milky. Well, ours, what, we, what we studied was looked like watered-down fat-free milk, and it was about a teaspoon in volume. And uh, the gushing and squirting, there's been studies done on that, but it is not what we call female ejaculation. It's gushing or squirting, and it does contain diluted urine with some of the components of the female ejaculation. Those components come from the female prostate gland. That we know. 
uh, Xavier Chuck did about 300 autopsies. And you're going to say female prostate gland. What about cancer? And he did find cancer in the female prostate gland. And very few women, but he did find it. And is it the Skeins glands? It's the Skeins or the periurethral glands, which are now called the female prostate gland. Yes. Which is around the urethra. They surround the urethra. So it's not coming through the urethra? It comes, they have these ducts that go into the urethra, and it comes out the urethra. The fluid from the female prostate gland goes into the urethra, and so that's what's coming out. Pardon? Similar to the male prostate. Similar to the male prostate, yes. And the glands are, I always thought they were right outside. They're around the urethra, and they have many ducts going that's into the, the ducts into, into the urethra. Thank you very much. Am I answering enough? Yes. Thank okay. You. Other questions about how you can conduct research or about my research? I can't believe I got through that quickly. I guess I spoke fast again, huh? <laughs> okay, you and then back there. Um, so in the study about the women with the spinal in injuries, I noticed that you spoke of several places where it was bypassing their injuries and going to their brain. There was no talk of the clitoris. So do, is there no bypass? Um, we brain? did not get activity from simulating of the clitoris. The sensory vagus nerves innovates the cervix, the uterus, and the upper part of the vagina. Uh, it does not innervate the clitoris. Yeah, I, I know, but I mean, come on, you know, we have to say what's there. And it's, this, uh, but they can have, or they do experience orgasm from stimulation inside the vagina and uh, of the cervix. And they did self-simulation in my lab, and we had devices where we measured the amount of pressure they were applying, because they couldn't feel the stimulus but they did experience orgasm, and we measured the exact amount of pressure they were applying so they wouldn't uh, be any damage to the tissues that they were simulating. And we used a tampon, something that would be natural. We used a tampon and we had a handle with the uh, pressure transducer so we could see how much pressure they were applying. And if they started applying too much, I would stop them. Uh, I just have to tell you, one woman had an injury two years before she volunteered to be a subject, and because she was told that she couldn't experience orgasm, she couldn't have any pleasure, she hadn't tried anything. In my lab, she had five orgasms. I tell you, I was crying, and so was she. The two of us were crying. I mean, it was just so, she said, I didn't know that could happen again. So it's, yeah, it's been very, very, very rewarding. And the women who have orgasm from imagery, you know, they're told, no, that can't be. And yet we measured it, and they certainly did. Is Just it thinking. Voluntary? <laughs> Pardon? The, the women who have. Uh, they're all volunteers, yes. No, but um, is it like when they orgasm from the imagery, is it voluntarily done, or is it sometimes involuntary? I, that's a good question. I tried very hard to have them tell me what they were thinking of when they were. And I'm either lousy at using a. a, a um, what I want to say? I'm lo losing the word. A recorder, recording what they say, uh, but they couldn't do it. So we had to do it retrospectively, tell us what you were feeling and what was happening. Somebody in the back had a question. Yeah, I'm just curious, you were saying that you think there's a need for much more research yes. on, on you know, sexuality. What would, what would you say are a couple of the most interesting questions for research? Well, I'd like to know more about other experiences that women have. I mean, I think it's amazing that the ones we've studied so far, people never thought it was a, that was important or that could ha occur. So I think we need to do more research on the different ways that women experience sensual and sexual pleasure. And why does it have to be just the genitals? I want to get out to other parts of the body as well. I mean, we use the nipples, but I want more because there are women who have pleasure from stimulation of all parts of their body, or as we said, from Im just imaging. So I want to see more studies on what all, uh, women are capable of experiencing, if they experience it. And that's what I do. I validate in the lab what they say is pleasurable for them. Yes? I'm just curious, is your research on trans women? I have not done, uh, conducted research on trans women. I have a very good colleague who does the surgery, and she's trans. Uh, am I using the correct term? She's a male to f female, and uh, we've been talking about doing some research together. And she's in the Philadelphia area. So I can even tell you her name if you want to, but. Uh, yep, yeah, Christine McGinn. Yep. Other questions? One of my
of the things, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things you mentioned when you were talking about research is that, yeah, and we can connect you to those people. Um, what kind of avenues do you suggest for budding researchers like ourselves to get connected to those types of people? Well, uh, first of all, if you're in a, a PhD program, you definitely will be connected to people in that program. If not, we, go through the, this is what I want you to do, go to search the literature, find out who's doing what you might be interested in, and then get in touch with those people. I mean, the spinal cord injury, uh, these women, I wrote a chapter on women in spinal cord injury way back, before we even did anything, because I believe these women, but it took a while to get to do, conduct the studies. And I was very lucky because Mitch, Mitch, I was on Mitch Tepa's PhD uh, committee, and he was very helpful too in helping us. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I don't think Mitch would mind. Um, Mitch is Orthodox Jewish, and I am godmother of his son. Now, they, I know there's no godparents, but I made <laughs> Jeremy possible. I told them what to do, how to do it, gave them the syringe, the whole bit, and uh, Jeremy is the result. So I'm really proud, and so is Mitch. Yes? Do you have tips on how to conduct a literature, like a search for literature? Sort of, I guess, like, if well, you're not in the position to do research yourself or to... Yeah, I mean, you have to, it really, it's so great now, you can Google almost any topic, and it all comes up. It is just amazing to me. My son does a lot of that stuff, and I'm, uh, it's way beyond me. Way, uh, I don't see Lorena here. She was at my house one day, and she said, "We, because uh, I'm not on Facebook or anything, I, social media." And she'll say, "Here's what you have to do." And I'm thinking, "Oh my God, you know," but uh, it can be done. And just doing searches, you'll find out who's doing it. I'm on something now called ResearchGate, and I get notices four or five times a day. Somebody's read your, your paper. You're the most read person in this area. I mean, it, it, so. Uh, you, you can just go on and you'll find them. Yes? I have a question about how you balance your work and your life with your family. Like, do you have any tips? I know it's, you can just be in, engulfed in your research and it's such a big yeah, thing, but uh, picture of your family. I don't know if you can hear her question, but how do I balance my life and my family? It's not easy, and that's why Jim and my husband and I are slowing down in terms of things that we're doing, doing more of what we want to do. And. Uh, Pardon me? You know what she's doing now at this age is way beyond many of us. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what it's doing now. Slowing down, we haven't even reached yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm just curious. I, I do a lot of survey research. Uh huh. No, no, really, uh, we're very lucky. Number one, the IRB, uh, first of all, my colleague was on the IRB review committee before we started research, so he knew what we had to say, so that was very helpful. But uh, we've been very lucky in having IRB approval. We had to for anything that we conducted. And, um, uh, no, and getting grants is very difficult for sexuality, but we've been very lucky that way, too to have funding for the studies that we've conducted. So um, you sometimes have to figure out where you're going to get the funding from. Like Christopher Reeve Foundation funded our work with the women with complete spinal cord injury. So you may have to go beyond what you think to get some research funding. And you do need funding. You can't just do it without funding. You need some support. How am I doing? I've got five minutes. Well, I, I'm really hoping that you all will send me your research uh, publications after they come out because I, I really want to see we need sexuality educators doing more research. You know what the problems are out there. You know what needs to be answered. And we need people like you to, to start conducting research. Whether it's just showing how effective your program is, we have to get the government to know this now with all the problems we're having with the government. We really need uh, good sexuality education. I know you all knew, but the abstinence only until marriage 
Only California refused the uh, funding. But now, still, we have nine states that that's all they teach. And they can't talk about methods of birth control. They can't talk about sexually transmitted infections. It's really scary to me what's going on. And we need the sexuality educators to say, hey, look, this is really effective. And uh, we need to do research in showing how effective you are in your sexuality education. So I thank so many of you for coming out today. I really do.